Good day. You're tuning in to Voice of the Voiceless. I'm Dan Kavalik, and I am so excited today because I am talking to the two authors that wrote this book, Socialism Betrayed Behind the Collapse of the Soviet Union, one of my favorite books. In fact, it's kind of a Bible of mine. I have with me Roger Kieran and Joe Jameson, a.k.a. Thomas Kenny. Uh, who wrote this book, and we're going to talk about it. And uh, I think this is going to be a great show. So stay tuned. Okay, so uh, I thought a good way, first of all, welcome, Joe, welcome, Roger. A huge honor for me to have you here today. Um, I thought I'd, st sure. I thought I'd start the show with a quote, and I would ask you both to re react to it. It's a two-part quote, and you can react to either or both parts. Um, it's a quote that, that's been attributed to Vladimir Putin, but I've also seen it attributed generally as, as a ma maxim now, uh, generally in Russia. And the quote goes something like, any person who did not shed a tear at the collapse of the Soviet Union has no heart. Any person who believes that the Soviet Union uh, will re resurrect itself uh, has no brain. Um, I'll just say my response to the first part is that I have shed many a tear over the collapse of the Soviet Union. Um, and I do to this day. And, and we're going to talk about that. Joe, why don't I get your reaction to that quote? Anything you want to say about it? Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, well, consider where it's coming from. Uh, Putin, uh, of course, is somebody who has lamented the, uh, the breakup of the Soviet Union. But of course, uh, he is talking about the disassembly of the multinational state, uh, the, the fact that Ukraine and uh, yellow, uh, Belarus and uh, Kazakhstan and all the other uh, states uh, in what they call the near abroad uh, left the Russian Federation or the Russian, the actual reality is the Russian Federation left them. Um, so uh, he, he separates uh, the question of uh, this question of socialism from, from the multinational federal uh, state. Um, and then on the matter of, uh, and so, so he has mourned the breakup uh, of the multinational Soviet Union uh, himself. Um, as for the question of the resurrection of the Soviet Union, well, um, history will be the judge of that. Uh, I'm not expecting, and we have no reason to any immediate uh, revival of socialism there, um, but ruling it out forever is a risky game. Um, I mean, after all, and it's a point we make in our book uh, that Metternich, who was the, uh, the leading voice of counter-revolution after the great bourgeois democratic revolutions, uh, the uh, French Revolution, uh, 1789, 1815, he at the Congress of Vienna, he thought, oh, that's it. Uh, we've done with liberty, fraternity, and equality. And a century later, uh, liberty, uh, fraternity, and equality were the slogans of most of the governments of Europe. So um, I think history will continue to move on because the basic motive forces uh, behind it are still there. So I wouldn't put too much um, as a short-term for forecast uh, Putin may be right, but uh, long-term forecast, uh, I have my doubts. That's my top-of-my-head reaction. Okay, good. Thanks, Joe. And Roger, how about you? Let me be a little more pointed. Why would someone shed a tear? Why should someone shed a tear at the collapse of the Soviet Union? Uh, well, first, let me say, not surprisingly, uh, I agree with everything Joe said. We, we wrote this book together and we have a, uh, we tend to think alike. But 
First of all, let me say that I think the the collapse of the Soviet Union was the uh, greatest event, the greatest uh, tragedy of the, the 20th century, and certainly the greatest event of the 20th century, most momentous since the Russian Revolution itself in, in uh, 1917. And I think I, the reason that it was so momentous, even for us and, and for the rest of the world, is that the world lost a uh, a counterbalance to American imperialism, that every struggle against uh, colonialism, against uh, imperialism for socialism that occurred in the 20th century had the support of the Soviet Union. And suddenly in 1989, that support disappeared. So, uh, and so since then, as you know, we've had uh, the U.S. dominating the, the world scene and uh, endless uh, uh, wars, endless oppression uh, fostered by and supported by U.S. imperialism. So I think that's why it's such a tragedy. And in terms of the future, uh, I don't have a very good track record, though I'm a historian, I'm predicting the future. I certainly didn't see the collapse of the Soviet Union coming. Uh, so whether things are going to, whether socialism will revive in the Soviet, in Russia, I, 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 it's difficult to say. I mean, history has a way of surprising us. Uh, Lenin said uh, during the First World War, he bemoaned the fact that he would never see a socialist revolution in his lifetime. <laughs> Within a year or two, socialist revolution had broken out. Uh, also, I think it's important to note that in the in Russia right now, uh, there's a tremendous, uh, let's say, nostalgia for, the, for Stalin and the Soviet Union. And uh, even among young people, even among, among people who had never lived through uh, socialism, I have a great nostalgia for it. So uh, uh, this seems to me bodes that well for uh, future change in the, in Russia. Yeah, and I want to just, you. no, thank you, Roger. And I do want to highlight a couple things you said. So first of all, uh, in terms of the nostalgia for the Soviet Union, the polls I've she seen indicate that at least outside Poland, that nostalgia exists in every former socialist East Bloc country. That is to say that a poll after poll shows that a majority of people in the former Soviet Union and the former East Bloc felt they lived better under communism than they do today. Um, I think in Hungary, the numbers are extraordinary, the percentage of people who say that, for example. Um, the other thing I want to highlight is something else you, uh, you also said, because I think a lot of people don't understand this that the Soviet Union, I see the Soviet Union as having a, a number of contributions to the world, but the two chief ones I see uh, is the defeat of Nazi Germany, which the Soviets were mostly responsible for. The 80 to 90 percent of the Nazis were killed on the Eastern Front. Most people don't know that. Not in the West, anyway. Um, and they bore the brunt of the war with about 27 million dead from in World War II. And the second biggest contribution that I see, and Roger, you touched upon, is that the Soviet Union supported the anti world anti-colonial struggle after World War II, supported nearly every country in the global South who wanted to and was struggling to throw off the chains of colonialism and neocolonialism. And, and probably the greatest example of this was the joint Soviet-Cuban effort in so Southern Africa, which not only defended the independence of Angola, it gained the independence of Namibia from South Africa and, in the words of Nelson Mandela, helped bring the apartheid South African government to the bargaining table with the ANC. Um, these are things that 
most Americans have no idea of, but these are huge contributions. So those are the things I think about when I think about um, the Soviet Union. Any other ideas before we move on? Uh, Joe. Yeah, well, I, I think there's a there's a third uh, possibly, and that is uh, uh, when uh, the Soviet Union started to develop its economy and and uh, its uh, political system. It's had an impact in the capitalist West. Um, it it produced a policy of concessions because there was a competition for the loyalty of the working class. And so for the period, especially between 1945 and 1975, you saw the development of a welfare state in Western capitalist countries, uh, which wouldn't have existed unless there were Eastern socialist countries that were forging ahead in producing a comprehensive social safety net. Um, even earlier than that, um, it wasn't any accident that uh, the demand of the women's movement, for example, for votes for women, suddenly was given in 1918. Why that breakthrough then? Well, the Soviets were allowing votes for women. Uh, so the, a lot of the democratic advances uh, in the West uh, were because there was ideological competition for the loyalty of the Western working class. Um, and so uh, it's, that's, I would say, the third uh, in addition to the two things you mentioned, uh, Dan, um, that's the third great impact of, uh, uh, of this, the policy of concessions that the Western capital, capitalist class was forced, uh, was forced to, uh, to give. Um, and the standard of living, it, they, they could not, you know, that, that uh, Dickensian standard of living that existed throughout much of the 19th century into the early 20th century, they couldn't do that. They couldn't get away with that anymore when standard of living was rising in the uh, socialist world. So um, it, that's, the, I think, the third most significant event or trend. Could I uh, please, add something to this? Please, uh, Roger, please. Uh, I think uh, also uh, we'd be remiss to uh, not mention the obvious, <laughs> the, uh, which is the success of the Soviet Union itself domestically. That is, it's uh, easily overlooked after the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1989, that before then, for 70 years, it was a viable system that made unprecedented uh, progress. Now, uh, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, you get People like uh, Fukuyama, Francis Fukuyama, uh, writing a book in 1992 saying at the end of history that uh, the future was uh, capitalism, that uh, there was no future for socialism. This was a this is the common way of viewing the uh, Soviet collapse. But let, let's not forget that for 70 years you had a viable system here. In fact, a system that made unprecedented progress, that took a country that was 90% peasant, impoverished, periodically racked by famine, that had, uh, which was an underdeveloped country, only 12% of the industrial production of the U.S., and within a generation made it the second largest economy in the world, a nuclear power uh, that provided unprecedented uh economic security and well-being to its citizens, free education, free health care, uh, no unemployment, and raised the uh, level of the hundred or so minorities uh, that were part of the Soviet Union, etc. No place on earth has uh, this kind of progress been made in such a short uh, period of time. And of course, along with this, as we mentioned before, the Soviet Union, even though its economy was never as big as uh, the American economy, was helping uh, Vietnam, China, uh, Cuba, uh, South Africa, and other countries as well. So it's a, uh, you have to add the, the domestic success of socialism as well as these other uh, uh, accomplishments that we've just been talking about.
You've been watching Voice of the Voiceless. I'm Dan Kavalik, and this is Socialism Betrayed Behind the Collapse of the Soviet Union. A great book. It's available for purchase right now. Pick one up. Um, and that's a good segue to my next question. And I'll stay with you, Roger, on this one. And then, Joe, I'll ask you for your comments. But, Roger, what you just said is a great segue into really the book. And, and, and because it begs the question, given those advances for the Soviet peoples uh, in such a short time, as you point out, um, why did it collapse? Roger, can you briefly, briefly tell us your, your thesis on that? Okay. Well, uh, you know... Even though the Soviet Union was, I said, a, a viable country who pr was providing economic growth two or three times that in the uh, Western world for, for most of those 70 years. Uh, um, and even though it had uh, defeated fascism, even though it suffered 27 million lo losses during World War II, one third of its cities destroyed, one Fourth of its factory, one third of its factories destroyed. It rebuilt in four or five years. So, in spite of all of this, socialism in the Soviet Union was not a utopia. There were problems, and uh, these problems uh, kind of gained an ascendancy in the 1970s and early 1980s. And uh, we discuss this in more detail in the book, but. It, in general, there were three areas of, uh, that, that were problematic for various uh, reasons. One was the economy, which uh, though it continued to grow, the, uh, the pace of growth uh, dramatically slacked off in the 1970s and early uh, 80s. It was still growing about 3% a year, but the standard of living was not going up as high. Investment was slacking off. Productivity was not keeping pace with what it was, et cetera. So there were these uh, economic problems. And second, uh, uh, well, you could say, well, why, why did these economic problems develop? Well, some of it has to do with the, uh, the problems of uh, uh, cent a centralized economy, of course. While a centralized economy uh, and, uh, had certain uh, advantages, and certain gains over time, a kind of uh, uh, problems developed with the centralized economy, particularly because it put a kind of emphasis on uh, quantitative growth rather than qualitative growth. And uh, so, um, in 1982, when when Andropov uh, came to power after uh, um, Brezhnev. Uh, he spoke to the Central Committee in 1982, and he outlined the problems. And, uh, and he pointed to this slowing down of growth, the slowing down of productivity. And the main thing he pointed to was that uh, the USSR, the Soviet Union, was not taking advantage of uh, its of technological innovation, uh, that it was not that was putting, again, too much of a emphasis on quantitative growth and not enough on, uh, on using science and technology. And he said, this, this is what um, had to change. So there were these economic problems. On top of that, of course, there were two other main problems. One, you could say political problems, which under uh, Brezhnev, a kind of political uh, stultification uh, crept into the Communist Party and the Soviet Union, because uh, coming out of the Khrushchev era, Brezhnev proposed this uh, uh, policy of, called stability of cadre, that is uh, to kind of keep people in their position and to avoid uh, conflict and factionalism. But what this meant was the uh, a growth of leadership that was kind of aged, that most of the Central Committee in the 1980s were in, their, were in their 70s, and many had been in their positions 20 or 30 years. So there was a need for new thinking and new blood, et cetera. Uh, 
uh, that was part of the problem. And also what happens when people stay in these positions for a long time, a kind of a corruption uh, developed. And the third problem, uh, besides the economic problem and the political problem, was uh, what was taking place abroad. We, we forget that under Carter and under Reagan in the late 1970s and early 1980s, there was a new Cold War. Uh, the uh, Reagan administration talked about bringing the Soviet Union to its knees economically. Um, that uh, they, the largest CIA operation in the entire uh, 20th century occurred in the early 1980s in Afghanistan, where the CIA tried to overthrow a uh, Soviet-supported progressive uh, government, and the Soviet Union had tried to counter this. Then you remember Reagan came up with this idea of Star Wars, uh, mm -hmm. which was uh, and involves trillions of dollars that the Soviet Union had to counter. And there was a, a boycott, economic boycotts imposed on the Soviet Union, etc. So um, uh, these three problems, the economic problem of the slowing down of growth, the political problem of a kind of aging sclerotic uh, leadership and the foreign policy programs, uh, problems created by this new Cold War meant that uh, something had to happen. So Gorbachev came to power and, uh, in 1985 and uh, said he was going to address these problems. But what he did was uh, um, address them in a very rash uh, way by trying to emulate uh, capitalism and turn the Soviet Union into a kind of Swedish model. This was reckless and stupid, and it led to uh, crashing the whole economy and the whole system. That is a kind of a thumbnail. Yeah, no, and I think that that's a good point. I just want to, you know, just one little fact to point out again to people who don't realize it, that most people think in terms of the Afghanistan, well, we actually, we were actively led to believe that the U.S. started supporting the Mujahideen, these jihadists in Afghanistan, in order to counter uh, a Russian, inv the, the Russian invasion of Afghanistan. Uh, however, Carter's national security advisor, Brzezinski, would later admit that, no, that wasn't true. In fact, that Carter started supporting the Mujahideen in 1979 before there was any Russian invasion in order to pro provoke a Russian invasion. He said in order to give Russia its Vietnam, which did happen and which did help greatly undermine um, the Soviet Union. Uh, again, a fact a lot of people uh, don't realize. Um, Joe, so I want to keep on this thread here. Um, a lot of folks thought and argue, uh, particularly Western intellectuals, that the collapse of the Soviet Union was somehow inevitable given the weakness in the system. Well, in your book, you seem to try to to counter that idea. What What is your view on that subject? Well, we think it was not inevitable by any means. Um, uh, there wasn't, as Roger outlined, the, the three major factors, the, the accumulation of problems. But an accumulation of problems uh, does not lead to necessarily to a crisis, and it certainly doesn't lead to a collapse. Um, there was something else at work, and uh, we think that it was the specific reform policies of Gorbachev that, le that uh, led to the dismantling of the Soviet Union. And the dismantling became a conscious process, especially in its later stages after 1987. Uh, but th these, this idea, the ideas of Gorbachev, they had, uh, they had an ideological history and they also had a material basis. And that's really the new part of our book, uh, because it's rarely discussed in the, 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 the bourgeois, uh, you know, the conventional 
uh, discussions of the causes of the downfall of the Soviet Union, um, there was a an ideological history in that as far back as, well, first of all, as far back two classes led the, led the Soviet uh, revolution. There was the working class and there, there was the peasantry. And those classes have a different outlook on the world. They have a different outlook on property, have a different outlook on uh, planning, a different outlook on the homeland, on a whole range of issues. Um, and so there was a question of which class outlook would prevail. Um, and so in the, in the 1920s, you had a thinker like Bukharin who gave voice to this, uh, what amounted to a peasant outlook uh, and who uh, uh, fought the rest of the leadership uh, and, and essentially proposed social democratic policies of gradual incremental change and who, who wanted to de-emphasize the role of the party, de-emphasize planning, slow down the pace of economic growth, minimize the threat of invasion from the West and, and so forth. And then 20 years later, this same outlook reappeared in the ideas of Khrushchev. Uh, and uh, you had Khrushchev repeating, even though he may not have been conscious that he was repeating, he was a leader of the Soviet uh, Union who was the closest to the peasantry in his day. And he was repeating the same formulations. And then 30 years later, you have uh, Gorbachev repeating the same formulations. So you had a, two trends, a social democratic trend and a revolutionary trend in the Soviet Communist Party. So this conflict between Gorbachev and his opponents had a long, long ideological history. In fact, it went back before the revolution, the Mensheviks and the Bolsheviks, but I, I won't get into that. So there was an ideological conflict between how to do reform, what should be the fundamental direction, what should be the pace of development. Um, and then there was a new element. Uh, unlike in the 1920s and up until the 1950s, uh, you didn't have that large a peasantry any longer, thanks to economic development and industrialization, but you did have something new. And that's what we highlight in our book, the development of a second economy, or if you will, underground economy or a black market economy. And this had been kept under control uh, in the first decades of the Soviet Union, uh, but uh, Khrushchev started letting, you know, relaxing controls. And under Brezhnev and his successors, uh, the, rela the relaxation continued. And this was the development of what amounted to a private economy, or at least uh, an stratum of entrepreneur and um, uh, business people who depended upon the corruption of the Communist Party to uh, survive in, the, in the, uh, the nooks and crannies of the planned dominant public um, sector. Uh, and this is what was new, and um, it was something that was profoundly corrupting, and it led to many other things uh, in terms of the politics of the country, and in terms of the growth slowdown that was so marked in the 1970s and 1980s. Um, the second econ economy was tantamount to the redevelopment of capitalist relations of production in Soviet society. And if you have any doubts about this, uh, when, when uh, Gorbachev hauled down the red flag in, uh, I guess it was around Christmas 1991, right. and uh, Yeltsin took over, there were shootouts in the streets of Moscow and Lenin Leningrad between the gangs of the second economy as they asserted control, uh, as they struggled to uh, acquire uh, these giant public enterprises and as the what amounted to gangster capitalism replaced a, a troubled form of socialism uh, in 1991 and the years immediately after. So um, this is uh, essential to our outlook on the material basis of this right wing move because how could how, one of the reasons the, the Soviet downfall, the Soviet demise was so shocking 
was how could a general secretary of a communist party that has been in power since 1917 to begin in 1987 or 88 to dismantle the system? It was almost unbelievable. What was the material basis of this? Well, there was a material basis of it. And um, we didn't see it, um, and but it was there. And um, in retrospect, it's obvious it was there. And um, uh, in your book, Ro I guess I'll go back to Roger. Thanks for that, Joe. Roger, you, the, I believe in your book, there's a poll, poll that's mentioned that was taken earlier in 1991 about whether a referendum or of sorts uh, about whether the Soviet people wanted to continue the Soviet Union. Can you tell us a little bit about that, Roger? Uh, yeah, this was just before uh, Gorbachev uh, dismantled the uh, multinational state, the Soviet Union, and a, a poll showed that um, most people opposed this. So the the uh, the man that the Western world was uh, touting as a great uh, Democrat uh, ignored the uh, vast majority of the uh, wishes of the Soviet people and went ahead with this anyway. Um, uh, let me circle back to your previous question, Dan, which I was thinking about while, uh, while Joe was talking, which was, was, that, was the collapse inevitable? And uh, it, it reminded me of uh, the remarks of, uh, of Fidel Castro, who in uh, 2006 uh, in his autobiography, which was uh, published about 12 years after uh, we wrote our book, uh, Fidel, who was obviously very much aware of what was going on in the Soviet Union as well as elsewhere in the world, uh, expressed an opinion very close to the one we expressed in, in our book, particularly towards uh, Gorbachev. He said at the beginning, he said, uh, Gorbachev sounded like a genuine revolutionary. That is, he wanted to tackle the problems of productivity, tackle the problems of unearned income or the, the second economy, uh, the black market. He wanted to tackle the problems of uh, alcoholism, etc. He said, Gorbachev spoke like a real revolutionary. But within a couple of years, uh, Fidel said, everything he was doing, I disagreed with. That is uh, weakening the Communist Party, weakening the party's con control over the uh, media, weakening the uh, centralized planning, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And Fidel also said, Socialism in the Soviet Union did not die of natural uh, causes. That is, it was not inevitable. He said it was a suicide, uh, a suicide engineered by uh, Gorbachev. And by Yeltsin. I mean, I guess there's this pact or unpacked that signed, I guess, in the woods somewhere between, Gorb uh, between Yeltsin and I believe... Um, the heads of, I believe, Belarus and Ukraine, if I'm not mistaken, where they essentially agree, again, behind the backs of everyone to to end um, the Soviet alliance. Am I correct about that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that, uh, Joe? Well, um that had to do to some extent with U.S. influence. Um, uh, at the time, uh, there was a debate in U.S. ruling circles about uh, whether to continue to back Gorbachev or whether to back Yeltsin. And uh, uh, some, some factions within the Bush, uh, the George H.W. Bush administration, uh, thought that they should stick with Gorbachev. And some thought they should go with, uh, because he would bring the whole of the Soviet Union, which was considerably larger than the Russian Federation, uh, he would bring the whole thing uh, to the West. Um, uh, others argued that Yeltsin was a more uh, reliable uh, tool of Western power. 
and he was. Uh, Gorbachev always, by this point, he had evolved into a social democrat. Uh, he wasn't a, a hundred percent uh, pro-capital, um, well, pretty pro-capitalist. Um, so uh, that debate was taking place. And essentially the decision came down to back Yeltsin and Yeltsin took the Russian Federation out with the Russian Federation that seceded from the remainder. Uh, even though these, uh, the peripheral states had declared their sovereignty, the actual final secession uh, took place when the Russian Federation uh, took over, uh, you know, left the other uh, Soviet states and, and essentially took over the union institutions. So uh, including the nuclear weapons. Uh, so that was um, the story in, in a nutshell. And um, I'll just note that today, you know, while Gorbachev is still a darling of the West, he's horribly unpopular in Russia. In fact, uh, <laughs> his advisor, Stephen F. Cohen, um, who, who, God rest his soul, who died fairly recently, who I got to know a little bit um, in his later years, told me that Gorbachev, who lives in Washington, by the way, that's how popular he is in Russia. He lives in Washington, D.C. Um, wanted to go back to Russia to attend a, a rally in Moscow and give a speech. And Cohen told him, this isn't, Cohen told me this, he told me that he told Gorbachev, advised him, don't go back. They'll lynch you. Um, <laughs> the West loves this guy. Russia hates him precisely for the reasons that the West loves him, and that is that he oversaw the collapse of the Soviet Union, you know, and this is, again, something not not generally, I think, known. Um, and and what, that collapse, what that collapse meant, Cohen was eloquent on the subject of, uh, I mean, he had illusions about Gorbachev, and uh, I think he had, he had, uh, he played a good role, uh, he played a good role in the latter years of his life. Uh, opposing the new Cold War, um, but he was full of illusions about Gorbachev at an earlier stage in his career. But when he wrote about uh, the consequences of the collapse uh, in the immediate aftermath of 1991, um, he referred to the demodernization of an, of an advanced industrial economy. Uh, when you have uh, male life expectancy, and this is, of course, is alcoholism. Male life, male life expectancy falling by, I think it was a decade, within just a few years. Uh, uh, you, you, the the social toll of mass unemployment in much of industrial, uh, what was left of industrial, the industrial Soviet Union, uh, was had to be catastrophic to it to achieve that kind of a decline in male life expectancy. And not to mention all the knock-on effects of that, um, spousal abuse um, uh, you know, and, and, and all the other social ills that um, come from the destruction of family life, which in turn arose from the destruction of economic life. So um, there's a reason why Gorbachev is hated uh, in so much of this, contemporary Russia. Yeah, I mean, I think... Also... If, uh, uh, go ahead, Roger. Go ahead, Roger. No, I was just going to say, uh, uh, I think it was Cohn who coined the phrase that the, the Soviet Union was the only uh, country in history that had ever been demodernized. That that's what Gorbachev brought about. And, uh, and I think... Cohn did play a, 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 a good role himself later in, in opposing this uh, uh, anti-Russia hysteria that uh, right. has existed in this country. But we should not let Cohn off the hook either. He played a role in the, uh, in the collapse mm -hmm. of the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. You remember his, his main book on the, uh, uh, on the Soviet Union was a biography of uh, Bukhara, who he loved. That was his hero. And uh, apparently Gorbachev read this book and was inspired by uh, 
uh, what Cohen had to say about Bukharin. And Bukharin, as you recall, was the architect and the advocate of uh, the NEP, the uh, New Economic Policy, which was uh, allowed uh, private enterprise to flourish for a time in the Soviet Union in the 1920s. So, that, so uh, Cohen bears some of the responsibility for the, uh, it seems to me, for the policies that uh, Gorbachev pursued. Well, and it was my sense. policies that Gorbachev pursued. It was my sense that Cohen understood that. It, you know, it was my sense that in his latter years, he desperate he worked so desperately to defend Russia against, you know, uh, just the the hysteria which still exists today. Um, he worked so desperately to defend Russia because I think he felt some guilt about. Yeah. The old the his role that he played um, in the collapse of the Soviet Union because I don't think uh, Cohen himself and if you read some of his books on the subject did not want the Soviet Union to collapse that he did, you know he might have been a social democrat but he was not anti Soviet he thought the so there was another path for the Soviet Union to fo to follow and I think he did regret regret any role that he had in, in, in its demise. So uh, Cohen is an interesting figure in that regard. I think he understood all those things and um, I don't think was that happy of a man at the end because of that, you know, um, was my sense. Um, it's one of these things, be careful what you wish for, I suppose. And I think that's true. <laughs> it's true. I think a lot of people are feeling that way. One figure again, I mean, I'm just spitballing here and I know I don't want to take much more of your time, but an interesting figure to me is Paul Craig Roberts, who worked in the Treasury Department under Ronald Reagan. If you read his stuff, he laments the collapse of the Soviet Union. I mean, he said that, you know, when the Soviet Union collapsed and the Eastern Bloc collapsed, and Western capital made a rush into these countries, right, to seize uh, control of their cheap labor and whatnot, uh, labor that had been cheapened by the collapse, right, uh, that you heard a giant sucking sound out of the United States. That is, this is, say, this had a horrible impact on Western workers, right, uh, because it created a downward pressure on wages and working conditions. Um, and this is an interesting thing that a guy who worked for Ronald Reagan would say that. But um, And I think people who are honest about true national security, and there aren't many of those people who exist in Washington, obviously, um, believe that the collapse of the Soviet Union d was not good for true Western security, right? I mean, that the Soviets were responsible in their international policies, they were responsible in how they, you know, maintained and secured their nuclear weapons. Um, that again, in terms of real security for the American people, it wasn't a good thing that the Soviet Union went away. Um, so there's all these impacts that I think people don't think about. But it's interesting, again, when a guy like Paul Craig Roberts uh, is honest about that. Um, I think we've covered a lot of ground, so I'll just give both of you, you know, chance to say final words on 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 this topic, Joe. What it what 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 are your final words on this? Well, uh, one thing we one thing we haven't discussed is that um, our book has uh, circulated quite widely. It's undergone uh, translation into um, eight languages and um, uh, three Spanish editions. And the thing that we're proudest of is that it's had quite an impact in Cuba. Um, back in 2014, uh, Roger and I were invited to the uh, Havana Book Fair. And thanks to a mutual friend of ours, Walter Tillo, who uh, uh, was looking after uh, Ramon Labanino, who was a, one of the Cuban five, who was a prisoner in Kentucky, in a federal prison, he gave uh, a copy of the book in English to Ramon, who's an economist and who reads English. And Ramon was 
uh, worried at that time about the, um, some of the initial changes and moves toward market relations in Cuba. So he uh, wrote to the authorities and, and had it published in, in Cuba in Spanish, translated and published. So um, I don't know, I can't speak to other socialist countries, Vietnam, China, and so forth, but it's been encouraging to us that uh, Ramon, who remains, uh, who when he was released, uh, got in and re remains in an important job in the Cuban government uh, as an economic advisor, um, and who was extremely conscious of the, the mistakes that were made uh, in uh, liquidating the party and uh, uh, and so forth. Um, it's, it's been encouraging that maybe Cuban socialism uh, is quite conscious of uh, all the mistakes that Soviet socialism made and uh, our book will, will um, benefit the Cuban re revolution. So uh, it's one of the things we're proud of. Well, you should be proud of, of this book. And again, maybe your book will do the opposite of what uh, Cohen's book did for the Soviet Union, uh, hopefully. Um, but yeah, this is a book I've read and reread, and I just uh, love it and uh, are so honored by you guys, really. And Roger, so what, are you, what, do you, what would you like to say in our final uh, minutes together today? Uh, well, what I'd like to say is to thank you for uh, directing attention to this topic, not just to our, our book, but it's the topic itself, I think, is so important. If anybody takes themselves seriously as a socialist, as uh, Karl Marx said, those of us who are struggling for socialism, he said, there's only one science, and that's the science of history, the study of history. We have to learn from history, learn from its mistakes learn from our mistakes, learn from our successes, et cetera. And that's what Marx did after the collapse of the Paris Commune, the first attempt at a kind of a, a socialist uh, society in uh, Paris during the uh, 1870s. After it collapsed in 70 days, he wrote a book trying to draw out the lessons of the Paris Commune. And after the collapse of the Soviet Union, after 70 years, I think it's imperative for us, socialists today, democratic socialists, communists, Marxist, Leninists, anarchists, whatever, to study what happened in the Soviet Union, its successes, its failures, learn from them so we can make a, a better effort going forward. Thanks again, Dan. I, I think it's a Thank crucial you, topic for all of us on the left, and I, I'm grateful for you to you for uh, focusing our attention on it again. Yeah. Well, th thanks, mm -hmm. thanks to both of you. This has been incredible. I want to alert our uh, viewers uh, to mltoday.com, which uh, is a website uh, that is very important to all of us where you can read more about this subject. I want folks to go out and buy Socialism Betrayed. I think you can even get it on Amazon if I'm not mistaken. Um, but get it where, where you know – other, this and other fine books are sold. And with that said, I want to thank everyone for tuning in today. This is Voice of the Voiceless. I'm Dan Kovalik, and you have been listening to Roger Kieran and Joe Jameson, the authors of Socialism Betrayed Behind the Collapse of the Soviet Union. Thank you very much. And so if you like Voice of the Voiceless, I hope you keep tuning in. You can find us on Spotify, Twitter, in Facebook. And if you find this program of value to you, uh, please consider joining us on Patreon. Thank you.